it might be an afternoon. <laughs> I'm going to pray for Pastor Jen before she um, gives us her word. So if you bow your heads with me, I'll pray for her. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your Sabbath, for the chance to rest, and for the message I know you have prepared for us through Pastor Jen. Um, speak through her. I know that her words are going to be a blessing to at least one person, and that is enough. Um, open everyone's ears, give us receptive hearts, um, and thank you in advance for what you're going to do through her. Um, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Um, we have been on a journey, and for those of you who are joining us for the first time, I just want to share a little bit with you. Our theme, as I hope that you can tell, is behind me, uh, what matters. And we, we're, just, we're exploring this all year. Our first focus was what matters to God. The authoritative message of the Messiah, the Sermon on the Mount. And on the sermon on the, um, at the Sermon of the Mount, or on the Mount, Jesus gave us the blueprint of what matters. And we have been discussing it week after week after week. And for those of you who may not remember, I'm going to remind you. And if you, at the beginning of this series, we handed out little cards, and it said what matters, and then on the back, it has all of the things that are about to show up on, here on the slide, okay? So as I'm going through this, um, if you received a card, right, um, but you lost it and you would like it, if you'd like one, or if you're new here um, and you would like one, um, our deacons are going to be passing those out. So I'm just going to ask if the deacons can just kind of go, uh, kind of make your way around just to make sure people, so people don't, aren't like, hey, 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 but that they can actually raise their hand and they can get one. I really want you to have one, okay? Because as we're exploring this, as we're going through this series, as we're asking ourselves, as you're making decisions, as you're surrendering your life to Jesus, as you're giving him your to-do list, as you're giving him your agenda, as you're, uh, you know, for those of you who haven't made any New Year's resolutions, but you're, you're going to maybe, you can ask yourself what really matters, and you will have this card to remind you from God's word. So humility, confession, we talked about gentleness, relationship with Jesus, kindness and forgiveness, motive, our motive matters, peace and loyalty. These are the things that matter to God. Are we humble? Are we willing to confess? Are we gentle? Are we gentle? Are we in relationship with Jesus and thus making an effort to be in relationship with one another? Are we kind? Are we forgiving as Jesus has been kind and shown forgiveness to us? What is our motive? Why are we here today? Why do we do the things that we do? What is our motive? Are we experiencing the peace that passes all understanding and then going forth and for being an instrument of peace? Loyalty, right? Remember this question? He is loyal to me. Am I loyal to him? So this is what we've been, we have been discovering and now we are going to be moving into kind of our second focus of this series, What Matters. First was What Matters to God. Now we're going to be looking at What Matters to Me. What Matters to Me. Now probably the single biggest problem with society, or one of them I should say, is you have a bunch of people, a whole lot of people, who are trying to figure out who they are, right? Who am I? What's my purpose, right? They frankly don't know who they are. And this is a huge reality for our young people. They are bombarded with messages of who they should or need to be. They are constantly trying to figure out 
who they are, what are they going to be in the future? Asking the question, why was I put here on earth? What is my purpose? In fact, we as adults know these questions don't just stop with childhood. We, we are in a constant search. We're in a constant search of who am I? What is my identity? Why are we searching all the time? Why are we searching this question all the time? When well, one reason is the enemy does all he can do to destroy our identity. He does all he can do to destroy our identity. He, he uses the media <laughs> and the other vehicles that we see in society to make us feel as if we've got to please everyone. We've got to please everyone. I need to do this because of my parents. My parents want this. This, is, this will be for my parents. I need to do this for my friends. I need to be this way for my boss. I need to be this way for society. On and on and on and on and on. And one reason we fall into the disease to please so easily is because we see what happens to those... <laughs> Let's be real. We see what happens to those who make a stand for what they believe in. We see what happens to those who put their identity in something other than what everyone else is asking for. They get called weird. They become outcasts. They, be, they, get, they get called fanatics. They get hated on in social media. I mean, I was, I was shocked, saddened at some of the responses of our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ if you had a different opinion on social media. It's crazy. If I stand in who I am and what I believe in, affliction is sure to come. And because we don't want affliction, we don't want problems, we don't want to mess around, rock in the boat, we just say what people want to hear. And because we do this so much, we lose who we are. Affliction is sure to come. Yes, my friends, of all ages, this is true. This is true. I'm not here to tell you this is not going to happen. But today we are reframing affliction. Does it sound good? Sounds good to me. We're going to reframe affliction. But before we do that, I need to give you some good news. Some good news. You need to know who you are. You need to know who you are. We've got to set the foundation. No more searching. No more dropping out of school to find your way, to find myself. No more. No more allowing your friends or the people around you to give you your identity. No more, no more shifting around like a chameleon depending on who you're around, changing your opinion for who you're around. So are you ready for your identity? Because I'm going to tell you, thank you, Corey, but I was supposed to say it, not you. <laughs> I'm kidding, Corey. Thank you for saying it. Yes, this is who you are. You are a child of God. You are a child of God. The creator of the universe. And if I see one teenager rolling their eyes at that answer, I'm going to come and knock you upside the head. Because, do you realize what this is? This isn't a cliche that parents say or the pastor says. You are a child of the one that we just praise God for. The one we just praise for speaking worlds into existence. You are his child. That means you're royalty. You're royalty. 
You're a prince, you're a princess, you're a king, you're a queen. Not because we deserve it, but because he loves us and he calls us his own. You are a child of God. This is who you are. And when Jesus died, you died. When he rose from the grave, you rose up with him to new life, to a new identity. And that identity is Jesus. It's Jesus. The devil wants to remind you of the things you've done, the things you've thought, whatever, whatever, whatever. I'm telling you today, when Jesus died, you died. And when he rose from the grave, you rose to a new identity. Your identity is Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is who you are. And all you ever have to be is what he's made you to be. It's all you ever have to be. And this is good news. This is freedom. No more searching. <laughs> My identity is Jesus. And my friends, if you identify with Christ, the world will never identify with you. You hear me? So all this trying to please the world, this is why you're in such conflict. Because when you identify with Christ, the world will never identify with you with you. 1 John 3.12 Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous. This is why Cain murdered Abel. Right here is the basis of all persecution. It's the basis of all persecution. The haters are going to hate. And when they see that you're doing good, when they see that you're making healthy choices, they are not going to celebrate you. Throughout history, beginning with Cain's murder of Abel, there have been those who oppose God's people. Cain's murder came from jealousy, coupled with pride. Now, doesn't that sound familiar? Satan, right? Satan was jealous of Christ. And this was coupled with his pride. That pride snuck into his heart. That jealousy snuck into his heart. This is what will drive humanity's hatred towards you when you're growing in Jesus Christ. Matthew 5, 11 through 12, our scripture for today. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Knowing our identification with Christ means hatred from the world, this gives us a clear perspective on our trials. We don't stand there and go, why me? When we see, when we see these verses, we can see very clearly that if we identify with Jesus Christ, there is going to be hatred from the world. But when we understand this concept, guys, it gives us a clear perspective of our trials because how was Christ treated I'm going to ask it again it gives us a clear perspective on our trials because how was Christ treated Ellen White says this look at this quote there was never one who walked among men more cruelly slandered than the son of man 
He was derided and mocked because of his unswerving obedience to the principles of God's holy law. Mount of Blessing. Nobody's been slandered like Jesus was slandered. No one among men was more cruelly treated than our Jesus. He knows, he understands. Members of Jesus' family hated him and did not believe him. The religious leaders of the people he loved, they were jealous and they wanted him dead. Even his own disciples, his close circle, right? His closest circle, they struggled with belief and self-centeredness to the point that they... They, didn't even, they weren't even really a true friend to him when he needed it most. In his saddest hour, they were sleeping. On, in his trial, they had dispersed. And then when he was crucified, So why would we, his followers, why would we, his disciples, expect less? Why would we expect less? In fact, in every age, God's chosen messengers have been reviled and persecuted. Abel, the very first Christian of Adam's children, died a martyr. Enoch, Enoch walked with God. But what does it say about the world? The world knew him not. He walked with God, but the world knew him not. Noah was ridiculed as a fanatic and an alarmist. Others had trials of cruel mocking and scourging. Others were tortured. Encouraging news, amen? Now, see, I know you guys are listening, because if you said amen, amen, I'd have wondered if you were listening to me or not. But maybe you are listening, and maybe you understand that although this does not seem like an encouraging message, I want you to hold on, because at first glance, it's not encouraging. But if we actually take a closer look, a deeper look, to see, we will see what an amazing privilege Christ is giving us. And this is why we're, we're, we're able to reframe affliction. Christ is giving me the privilege to stand firm in my identity. And what is my identity? Christ. Who is my identity? Christ, yes. Christ is giving me the privilege to stand in my identity and to rejoice that his afflictions are being fulfilled in me. Scripture says this. His afflictions are being fulfilled in me. Now I rejoice in my suffering for your sake, for in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, the church, which is filling up the lack of Christ's afflictions. Now, let's be clear. This can be a confusing verse. Uh, this text does not imply that there is a deficiency in Christ's anointing, death, and suffering on the cross. Not at all. This would contradict Paul's intent, his whole intent for the letter to the Colossians. This would contradict the whole Bible. All right? Christ's suff sufferings are sufficient. Amen? They are sufficient, and nothing of one's own can be added to secure salvation. All right. What was lacking, what was lacking in Christ's afflictions was the future suffering. That's what it's talking about. The future suffering of all who, like Paul, will be called to experience affliction for the sake of the gospel. In other words, when we are persecuted for Christ... When we are persecuted for his sake, we continue to proclaim the gospel. We continue to further the gospel. 
the gospel, the gospel becomes brighter through our afflictions. Do you see this? I can say that I delight in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Because as I move forward in affliction, every time I move forward in Jesus Christ and I'm being persecuted because of my stand in Jesus Christ, and I move forward in that, in faith, the gospel is made brighter and it goes further because of my trial. Makes you look at affliction a little differently. The next time you're going through an affliction, the next time you're going through a trial, the next time you feel persecuted, maybe instead of, why me, God, why me, why me? Maybe instead say, God, what is your plan for this trial? Where is your glory going to be shown through what I am going through right now? How will you be glorified in this, God? Wow. Through reproach and persecution of his children, the name of Christ is magnified and souls are saved. Isn't this why we're here? We were not meant for this COVID-infested place. We weren't. This, is, this was never meant to be our home in the fallen state. God has a much better place prepared for us. And so when I am persecuted through the name of Jesus Christ, others benefit. Amen. And yes, I realize this is a very um, different mindset than we're used to. We come out of the birth canal thinking of ourselves. We have to be trained and molded to think of others first. But this is what God is calling us to do. The reproach and persecution of his children, the name of Christ is magnified and souls are saved. Wow! Wow! This is amazing. My affliction is his adoration. Come on now. Talk about affliction being reframed. My affliction is his adoration. So the next time I'm afflicted, I can praise Jesus because he's being adored. And not afflicted because of my own stupid choices. That's just cause and effect. <laughs> but when I'm afflicted because I'm taking my stand and my identity in Jesus Christ, he is adored. I want to tell you an exciting story. I'm not going to do it justice, so if you want to hear it from the author of the person it happened to, uh, you can check it out on the uh, North Pacific Union uh, Conference, our union's uh, Facebook page, Northwest Adventists. They've been doing a 10 days of um, prayer revival. And the first speaker, and, and some of you guys heard this story already, who was at our first um, 10 days of prayer. But the first speaker was uh, Pavel Goya. And he tells the story, and I'm telling you guys, it rocked my world. Um, it, I mean, it brought tears to my eyes, and I had to share it with you today because it is just so to the point of our affliction being his adoration. He was, he's Romanian. Um, he was serving in the Romanian army, I should say. And he's an elderly uh, gentleman, uh, not too elderly. No, I better be careful. He could be, he's not watching this, but you're not elderly if you're watching. Um, anyway, but he, he was serving in this, the army, and he was brilliant. You know, I, I'm, those are my words. He did not say that he was brilliant himself. I'm saying it. I mean, he was physics. He was brilliant in math and all these things. And so he went to work in the army and, um, for this communist, for the communists. And he was, you know, serving his country. And as he was serving his country, they noticed that he didn't work on Sabbath. And so uh, one of his comrades, you know, noticed that he wasn't working on Sabbath, and they said, they said, Goya, 
you're going to get in trouble. You're going to get in trouble. Why don't, why don't you work on, why don't you have to work on Sabbath? And he says, well, I don't work on Sabbath because I love, I love my country. I love my people. I'm happy to serve the army, but my God comes first. My God comes first. They're like, oh, you're going to get in trouble. Well, sure enough, a commanding officer came, found out that Goya was not serving, uh, was not uh, working on Sabbath. And he said, Goya, do you realize, do you realize that if you defy me, if you defy me before the whole regiment, that automatically gets you into 40 years of prison, if not executed? And so Goya says, yes, sir. He says, why don't you work on Sabbath? He didn't say Sabbath, Saturdays. And Goya said, well, because I put my God first. He goes, do you love your country? Yes, sir. Do you love your comrades? Yes, sir. Well, you know that you're putting them in danger. No, sir. How am I putting them in danger? You're putting them in danger because if we were to be attacked on a Sabbath day, you wouldn't have their backs. Goya says, no, sir. If we were being attacked on a Sabbath day, I would stand behind my brethren and I would, I would defend my country. But are we being attacked? It was the Sabbath day. And he says, well, no. But what if? He says, I, I would stand behind my country. So he said, I'm going to call the whole regiment. And the regiment was 5,000 soldiers. I'm going to call them all next Saturday. And if you defy me in front of all of them, you go to prison. Goya says, okay, sir. He dismissed Goya. Sure enough, next week, next Sabbath, he called 5,000 soldiers. Called Goya up. It was the Sabbath day, and he said, Goya, dig me a ditch. Now this ditch that Goya knew he wanted him to dig was going to take a good uh, 6 to 12 hour. I mean, it was going to be a ditch. And so he said, no, sir, I, I won't work on the Sabbath. He goes, Goya, we're being attacked. The planes are coming. You need to dig that ditch for you and your comrades to fall into the ditch and be saved. Goya looks up. He looks around. He goes, I don't see the planes. He goes, I don't see that we're being attacked. And the commanding officer is getting more and more red in the face. And he says, pretend, imagine. And Goya says, well, imagine I dug the ditch. <laughs> this guy was pretty brave. That's all I have to say. Oh, that made this guy furious. You could see the steam coming out of his ears. He says, you have defied me in front of 5,000 soldiers. You are going to prison. Well, Goya left the stage and immediately went to this warehouse that he had been working in. And he shut the doors and he got on his knees and he starts saying, Jesus, Jesus, I don't want to go to prison. I don't want to go to prison, God. I want to be sure. I want to be your servant. I want to put you first, but I don't want to go to prison. And he said, all of a sudden, he just could. It's like he couldn't pray anymore. And he, and he didn't have peace about what he was praying. And it's as if the Holy Spirit just came over him. And Goya started asking himself this, this question. Well, why not? If you're number one in my life, God, if you're 100% number one in my life, why wouldn't I be okay going to prison for you? And he realized for the first time that his prayers so often were, God, save me from this and I'll serve you. Do this for me and I'll serve you. Look, God, I've been faithful to you, so therefore take care of this problem. And instead, Goya said he just... He just loosened his hands. He said, God, you know I don't want to go to prison. And I ask you to save me from that, but God, even more, if you want me to go to prison, I'm going to go. And I will go faithfully and serve you because I know you'll have a purpose in that prison. Because I want your will, 
more than I want my will. And he said as soon as he surrendered that, as soon as he surrendered that, a peace came over him like he could not explain. He wasn't nervous anymore if he was going to prison. He knew he probably was. But he was okay. Because he said, ah, God, you're number one. And if you are number one, then no matter where I go, you will be with me. He was willing to turn his affliction into God's adoration. And so, he, so as, he was, as he was kneeling, he gets this knock on the warehouse door. And Goya is very nervous, right? He opens up the door to one of his comrades. He says, do you know Sergeant Captain such and such? I don't know what his name was. But it was like this high, high, high guy up. In fact, he was kind of under the president a few notches. I mean, this was a top dog. He goes, do you know him? Goya says, no. His comrade says, you must know him. Goya says, no, I don't know him. I swear on my life, I don't know the man. He says, well, he came to the, to the, um, the grounds today. He came on this campus today. He does these random checks. He does these random checks, and he chose our compound to check today. And he came, and he gathered us all together while you were here in the warehouse, and he said, he said, two years ago, you guys asked me for money because this was broken, this was broken, this was broken, and I didn't give you any money. But I'm now here on this compound, and I see that these things are fixed. Who fixed the fence? They said, Goya. Hmm. Who fixed the roof? Goya. Did you pay him? No, he just saw that it needed to be done, and he's skilled, and so he did it. He said, hmm, who put in the art in the museum? Who made the beautiful glass to go over all the artifacts and put, put uh, fabric over it so it doesn't, you know, get scratched? Who did that? Goya, he's very skilled in glass. And he starts asking all these things. Goya, Goya. He says, well, how has this, band, how has this man been rewarded? Well, he just got sentenced to prison for 40 years. He says, what? He says, you mark my words. No one touches Goya. And whoever tries to touch Goya, he will go to prison for 40 years. Goya served the rest of his time in the army untouched. He could keep his Sabbaths. He could continue to serve his country. And yes, this, this story of Pavel Goya, it turned out good. His faithfulness was rewarded. But Goya had come to the conclusion that even if it didn't turn out the way he wanted, he was going to be at peace. He was going to be at peace. While slander may blacken the reputation it cannot stain the character that is in God's keeping. A man whose heart is stayed upon God is just the same in the hour of the most afflicting trials and most discouraging surroundings as when he was in prosperity. When the light and favor of God seemed to be upon him. Do we act this way, brothers and sisters? Do we act the same? Do we believe the same? Accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior, it forever changes our identity. <clears throat> to endure situations beyond our human capacity. I want to say that again. I want it to sink in. Accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior forever changes our identity to endure situations beyond our human capacity. We don't have to fear. We don't have to worry. I was a part of a small group Bible study when I was planting a church in Seattle, a part of a team that was planting a church in Seattle. And at the end of this um, 
study. Tammy, would you grab my water right there and bring it to me, hon? I don't, because I have a tickle in my throat. Um, when I was in this, this Bible study, this, we were coming to the end of it. Thank you. We were coming to the end of it, and we were kind of making decisions like, oh, yes, we want to be all in. And she stood up and she says, I don't want to be all in. It's just too great a cost. She goes, I know, because this Bible says so, we've read it together, that whoever loves Jesus is going to be hated by the world. And I don't want to be hated by the world. I don't want it. And I do love Jesus. I want to follow him, but I, I'm not ready. I don't, I don't want to be hated by the world. So I'm out. And we're all sitting there like, hmm. Well, man, at least she's honest. Because we are all, you know, you, you kind of think about this. This is, this, you're like, well, I, don't, I want Jesus, but I don't know if I want all that. We prayed over her, and we prayed for her, and at the end she's like, no. It's not worth the sacrifice. Now, I don't know where she is today. I don't know if Holy Spirit kept working on her heart. I pray that he did, and she changed her mind. But she gave up at that moment. I'm not, I'm not projecting her future, but at that moment, she was giving up really everything to gain nothing. I mean, really. Has there been one thing in this world that you've gained that has lasted you forever? That hasn't broken down, disappointed, fallen short? Accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior forever, it changes us. It changes us. Yes, we will go through trials and tribulations. We will go through persecutions and sufferings, but we don't go through any of it alone. None of it do we walk through alone. And what we gain, and what we gain, and what it gains for the gospel, it surpasses all the temporary, momentary pain. We can, as our scripture suggests, rejoice, rejoice, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Why? For great is your reward in heaven. But guys, I'm telling you here right now, but great is also your reward on earth here and now. The reward of walking in the steps of Jesus, going through what he went through, but with him by your side. Giving you strength as through your trials you grow closer and closer with him. There's a song that talks about the thief on the cross saying to Jesus, how fair is it? All right? Or people looking on to, looking on to the scene of the thief of the cross, when the, scene of the cross when the thief says, Jesus, save me. I want to be in your kingdom. And Jesus says, right? I tell you, this very day you're going to be in the kingdom with me. And people looking at that going, how in the world is that fair? I've journeyed with Jesus all my life, and that dude gets to confess right before he dies and makes it? And the song goes on to say, no, you got it all wrong. Blessed is he who had the privilege of walking with Jesus for that long a time. For seeing the blessings every day. With every struggle, with every struggle that you face in your identity in Christ, the gospel goes out into the world and we are one step closer to home. Think of that. Think of that the next time the news reports something horrific. Well, we're one step closer. And God, how would you use me? We can do all things through Jesus Christ who gives us strength. Amen? And in Christ alone, in Christ alone, our afflictions become his adoration.
Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless faith, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till all the Today, for our closing prayer time, I want you to pray for the person next to you. And I want, I want everyone prayed for. Make sure no one is left out. Look down your pew. And this is what I want you to pray. First of all, I want you to personally pray that that person will understand, fully understand that they are a child of God. This is your identity. When you know that is your identity, we will go forth and we in Jesus Christ will change the world. When you know who you are. So I want to ask that you will pray for that person, that they will know their identity in Jesus Christ. The second thing I want you to pray is that they will surrender. Pray for them. That they will have the strength to surrender their afflictions to be his adoration. Those two things. Now, if there is a personal request that someone wants you to lift up, go ahead and do it. So we're going to spend this time making sure that we are all prayed for, and then I will come and have a closing prayer. All right, so spend this time right now. Please find someone next to you and, ask, and pray for them. All right? Can I pray for you guys?
Let's pray together, and if you're still praying for someone, continue, please. But I'll close this in prayer. God, each of us have been lifted up. Not just a cliche closing prayer, but each of us have been lifted up to you. And Lord, I pray that we will know that we are your child first and foremost. This is who we are. And God, in your strength, in your strength, may we surrender our afflictions to you so that you may be adored, you may be praised, and your gospel may be completed throughout the earth. We love you, Jesus. We thank you so much for all that you endured for us. And now, God, in your strength, in your strength alone, may what we go through, God, may the little that we go through, may we not look at it, may we not get discouraged by it, may we not allow it to define us, but may we surrender it to you, God, and use it for your glory. This is our prayer, Jesus, and we thank you and praise you for what you have done, what you are going to do, and what you will, you will continue day by day as we surrender these things to you. We praise you, God. We praise you, and we thank you in your heavenly name. Amen. Happy Sabbath to each and every one of you. So excited that um, you've joined us today. You'll be dismissed by our deacons, and I look forward to meeting you out there in the foyer. Please stop by and say hi if I have not met you. God bless. Happy Sabbath.